What's up, everybody? Welcome back into a video that was pretty heavily requested, right? We did the Menendez Brothers podcast with John, I think it was two weeks ago now, um, and we've been waiting to see what's going to happen with this new evidence. Will they get a new trial? Where the, will they get resentenced? Will they get released from prison where they have been for a very long time? Well, a press conference was held where their attorney was there. The attorney for the family was there. Members of the family was there all in support of the Menendez brothers, which is very unusual in a situation like this. Jose's family, Kitty's family, literally the victim's family, also the defendant's family, most of whom is supportive of the Menendez brothers. It's pretty wild. And the lawyer gives us some behind the scenes information, a look behind the curtain of what they're doing, how different this is, what the next steps look like and why they are all gathered here today. So we're going to watch this press conference together, react to it, see what we can learn and how it may or may not affect the case going forward and what we think the outcome of all of this is going to be. So make sure you guys hit the like button. Make sure you get your questions and comments in the comment section so I can follow along on what you think of this press conference. So this is uh, Garagos. He is known for representing a bunch of celebrities and doing press conferences and being on these high profile cases. Well, here's yet another one. He's going to kick us off here with the press conference. He's going to introduce some of the family members that are going to speak, but he's going to give us some insight about how different this case is and what the next steps look like and what they're hoping to accomplish. So it's hard to see the somewhere of Gina Blandian, the, who have been working for the last 18 months in order to get a release for Lyle and Eric Menendez. A couple of weeks ago, uh, and so you understand the background of it. Back in May, we filed a writ of habeas corpus. A judge in this courthouse, Judge William Ryan, issued what's called a informal request for a reply. That informal request for a reply was to ask the DA to respond to the allegations of new evidence. Part of the two prongs of new evidence were number one, a letter that was found at Marta Cano's house that was a letter written by Eric fully eight months before the killings to his cousin Andy. His cousin Andy testified at the trial. However, in the second trial, was demeaned as making this up or was not true. This letter. So important because any additional corroborating information you have to the abuse to cousin Andy, um, more information that's coming, all of that to me is incredibly important. Would it have made a difference? We don't know, but it's, a, it's at least enough to get the appellate court and now the state attorney's office to get their attention, to give this thing a second look. So it is really important new evidence, even though Andy was able to testify. So some of that information was able to come out. We actually have purportedly the letter from months and months before when, you know, everybody said, why didn't they mention this before? This again would corroborate that they may have, even though it wasn't explicitly stated in the letter. There now shows or corroborates that Andy was telling the truth. The letter describes the abuse. The letter, I believe, was released at least temporarily by the DA's office. And anybody who wants it, we can release that as well. The other pillar of the uh, writ of habeas corpus was a declaration by Roy Rosello. The declaration by Roy Rosello is incredibly important for a number of reasons. Number one, Roy Rosello, who was a member or a then member of the band Menudo, was and took great courage at Murray's uh, finding him and talking to him to sign a declaration that said that he too was assaulted by um, the, uh, the father. And not only imagine what it took for that. Imagine what it took for him to come out and say that. And again, I, I was wondering, like, it took all of this stuff happening. And then he comes out, which is potentially one of the biggest bombshells that somebody that is pretty famous, and this could have negative effects on him. And you can imagine how difficult it was and how he's been living with this for so long, and now it comes out. Signed declaration. Big deal. ...assaulted, but it happened at the house. The reason that's important is that it corroborates what was testified to in trial number one. And it corroborates the fact that the safe place that Jose thought he had was in the house. It corroborates what the family member said was the very uncomfortable rule in that house that you could not go down the hallway if Jose was with one of the boys. That was the, the, the ground upon which he played. Oof. I mean, how brutal. And again, if the Menudo boy corroborates that with what the Menendez brothers said, it just, you start to see the story differently. And again, in my head, the drama was kind of my most intense and initial 
um, look into this case. And then I looked at some of the real court documents and some of the clips from the actual trial, the first trial. And again, you see, he keeps referencing the first trial and he's going to continue to do that because that was the trial they won, which was a hung jury, which a lot of people voted for not guilty, or at least not the top charge, which they were eventually convicted of in a second trial that looked very different than the first trial. Um, and so you're going to hear him reference the first trial a lot more than the second trial. There's a reason for that, obviously, right? He's a lawyer and this is a press conference, not real rules of evidence or things you have to abide by. You got to be ethical and tell the truth and be honest. And that's what he's doing, but there's no cross-examination. Nobody's coming up and giving an argument after him. So he is explaining this stuff in a way that looks best for the brothers, which is in fact his job. And there's a lot here to do that with. Just honestly, an honest look at this case does say that. We have those two items. Now, there is a separate trial. About three months ago, we sent a petition. And mind you, the DA's office, there's been those who have said, well, this is election uh, nearing, blah, blah, blah. We filed this. The DA has been, Mr. Gascon's office, has been engaged with us productively, strongly, for well over a year. Joan, who you will hear from in about five minutes, we actually, because of her young age, turns 93 next month, we had a what's a very rare thing done in fact in December, which is called a conditional examination. It's a deposition in a criminal case to preserve her testimony. She was there with her lawyer, Brian Friedman, who represents the family. And that's just because of her age. And if she is no longer around later, they wanted her testimony on the record memorialized. So now they can use it as if she is going to present live at any hearing or trial they may have to have in the future. And they did that officially to preserve it. And what we are also in a parallel track doing is asking and have been asking the DA to look at the work they have done and resentence them to support the resentencing. Now, when I say the work they have done, Lyle and Eric have started, mind you, since 2005. So before he gets to what Lyle and Eric have done, they're, I think they're pushing mostly for a resentencing because they realize a resentencing will be, you can get out now or very shortly from now. But I did really enjoy personally this discussion about rehabilitation. And how it is possible. It can happen. And it, according to him, who knows them, has talked to them. You don't have to believe him. I don't know them. I haven't talked to them. But according to, to Garagos, they have been rehabilitated. And to think that that can happen in our prison system is a good thing. That's what we should want at the end of the day. Now, some people are found to not be rehabilitatable. And they may fit in that category as well. We have to realize that because the crimes that they've been convicted of and the sentence attached to it. But the possibility of rehabilitation is a good thing. I know you might not like that. People might not want to hear that, but that's the society we live in. That's a civilized society. It's not supposed to be just punishment, throw them in there and let them, you know, all beat on each other and have horrible things done to all of them when they're in prison. When I say the work they have done, Lyle and Eric have started, mind you, since 2005, up until the time that Judge Ryan issued the request for an informal reply, have had no hope of ever getting out. Since 2005, they had exhausted all legal remedies. They had resigned themselves to being in prison for the rest of their lives. Why is that important? Why did he mention that? Why did he mention they have no hope of getting out? Uh, they know they're going to be in there for the rest of their lives. He mentions it because he knows some people are going to say, this is fake. They're all faking it. They did all this stuff. They checked all these boxes. They went to school. They helped people just so that they could use it for their own personal gain to get out of prison early. He's like, not here. Since 2005, and you may be asking, they were convicted in the early 90s. Why 2005? All the post-conviction remedies were exhausted in 2005, he said. So since 2005, they have known for a fact that they're not getting out. They're going to be in there for prison. So what do they do? They could have chosen either path, right? Be horrible or be reclusive or, you know, don't talk to anybody or fight with everybody or get in a gang or whatever, or try to better themselves and try to better others and help others. And he's saying they chose the right path for no real selfish benefit or gain because they couldn't get out. They don't think they can get out when they're doing all this good stuff or all this rehabilitation. And they still did it. It's a pretty strong argument. You can take two, tra two tracks on that. You can either just become a hardcore, uh, irreconcilable uh, recidivist, or you can do what they've done, which is create programs, counsel people develop amazing programs, mentoring people, go to college, get degrees. Lyle, in fact, graduated from the first ever class in June. I watched it a, of a combination of UCI along with the Department of Corrections. The first class, Mr. Friedman and I were there, of 22 prisoners who got their BA degree while in prison. 
I have, I have a bunch of them, life without parole. So there is an idea that there is redemption. There is an idea with their green space project of rehabilitation. I will tell you in 40, over 40 years of doing this, I have never seen the amazing exemplary rehabilitation and mitigation evidence that we have now presented to the DA's office. So first off, people are going to ask what recidivist is. That's basically a reoffender. Recidivism rates are studied and how often do people get out of prison and have been convicted and then they, they reoffend and they end up back in there and that can come into play with parole boards and things like that as to whether or not to let people out. Um, so that's what recidivism and recidivist means. For him to say in 40 years, this is the best he's ever seen is two things. That's impressive. That's a big deal. We should listen to that. But also it's really sad at how few and far between good rehabilitation ever happens in a system that is supposed to at least partially be rehabilitation. Definitely a big part punishment as well. And to prevent people or deterrence, deter future bad action by other people that see what happens. But it's very rare. So if this is real and if this has happened, people are going to pay attention to it. And it's gotten the, it's gotten the, uh, the attention of the state attorney's office. We're going to hear from the family today briefly, and I will tell you, I'll give you kind of a coming attraction. I will start with Anna Maria. She will tell you exactly the genealogy. We have over 20 relatives, both Kitty and Jose sides of the family. This is virtually unprecedented in my practice, and I would I dare say it anywhere, that 20 family members of both sides, victims, constitutional victims under Marcy's law, are here to urge the DA to resent. Then after they're speaking, finished speaking to you today, we will then, Mr. Friedman will take them across the street to the Hall of Justice, and they will go through what what Gascon does uh, with, in resentencing, and they will meet with the resentencing unit. They will, under the California Constitution, Marcy's Law, they will voice their opinion on why they believe it's time that these gentlemen come home. That they so you, again, he's focusing on resentencing, and they're going to get to go and, and discuss their opinions and what they want and what they think, because under Marcy's Law, which a lot of states have it, Florida is one of them, Victims have rights. They have rights to be the right to be heard in certain situations. They have the right to be heard on sentences and deals and what happens. And in this situation, these family members are considered victims and family members of the victims, even though they're also related to the defendants because it's a family affair here. And so they are going to exercise their rights under Marcy's law to go and say, we want these boys to come home. We want their sentences to be done. They've paid their price. They've paid their, their sentence, their penance, whatever you want to call it. They've done it. Let them come home. They've rehabilitated. They're doing good in the world. They will be good contributing members of society. Now we want them to come home. And that's going to ring true in a lot of the statements that the family members say. We spent over 35 years, and I've said it once, I've said it twice. If they were the Menendez sisters, they would not be in custody. We have evolved. It's time. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Anna Maria, who's going to come up and speak. So... He, he threw a little comment in there that if they were the Menendez sisters, they would already be home. And there's, there's two kind of common themes we're going to hear throughout a lot of these comments. And it's that, that either nobody believes them, or if this was girls, it would be different. Um, or we believe them all along. We would let them come in our house, you know, about their character specifically, but also politics. This isn't political. We're not doing this for political gain. We hope none of the DA's office is doing this for political gain. We hope whoever comes in, whoever wins the election, we hope it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything because this is right and right is right. And we should be fighting for justice in our justice system. And that's the way it should be. That's the way it has to be. But so many of them uh, mention politics and how it shouldn't play a part here. And they're right. But I think it gives you a little heads up that if they have to mention it this much, it's, it's at least a worry in their minds. But again, we've seen it happen in other cases. What they don't want is this to just be a campaign material for one of the people running for election. And then if that person loses, the other person has to do the opposite. So I do think they're trying to guard against that. My name is Anna Maria Baral. I am the niece of Jose Menendez. I stand before you today, not just as a member of the Menendez family, but as someone who believes in truth, justice, and healing. Before I get started, I just wanna say that I know this is an election season. But for us, this is not a political issue. This is about truth, justice, and healing. On behalf of our whole family, it is my honor to formally introduce our new coalition, Justice for Eric and Lyle. Like so many others, I struggled to process the events of that fateful August day and the loss that I felt. Over time, it became clear that there were two other victims there on that day, my cousins Lyle and Eric. Lyle and Eric would continue to be victimized. They would be victims of a system that wouldn't hear them. And they would be victims of a culture that was not ready to listen they would be mocked. They would be called cold-blooded killers, left to rot in jail and denied any hope of redemption. If Lyle and Eric's case were heard today, 
with the understanding we now have about abuse and PTSD, there is no doubt in my mind that their sentencing would have been very different. And yet, despite their circumstances, they have chosen a life of light. Without hope of release, they persevered. They have sought to better themselves and serve as a support and inspirations for survivors all over the world. Their continued incarceration serves no rehabilitative purpose. It's time to recognize the injustice they've suffered and allow them the second chance they deserve. Now here we are, both sides of the family united, sharing a new bond of hope. Hope that with the re-examination of their case, a new outcome will be reached. Hope that this 34 year nightmare will end and that we will be reunited as a family. I am here to ask the district attorney's office to take into account the full picture, the truth that was hidden for so long. Lyle and Eric deserve a chance to heal and our family deserves a chance to heal with them. Please join us. Visit www.justiceforericandlyle.org and sign our petition. And if you'll indulge me, I have two more statements to read. The so she's going to also read statements of other family members. But again, she talks about how different the culture is, how different the media is, how different we see things today. And we have viewed them very differently back in the 80s and 90s. And I don't think she's wrong, right? And why is that important? Is it just like, oh, well, we're softer now or we're more enlightened now or whatever it may be? Well, whatever you want to call it, the point is the people in society today sit as your jury today. And she's saying, if this happened today, it'd be very different with how society thinks and lives and what we know and do than what it was back then. That's what she's arguing. And while again, that's not necessarily a bar for an appeal, we're saying like, oh, well, if things have changed and the, the jury would do something different today, that's not necessarily something that we do. But, but in a situation like this with the new evidence, in the interest of justice, will it have an effect on the appellate court or the DA's office? The first is from my mother, 85 years old, Terry Baral, the sister of Jose Menendez. She can't be with us today due to health challenges, but she sent me this. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person to support my nephews, Lyle and Eric. I begin chemo soon and my doctor says no fights. I need to be strong. I wish to make it clear that I stand firmly with this family. I am Lyle's godmother, and I love them both very, very much. My nephews have spent three decades in prison helping others. I have seen great growth in them. Even the law enforcement supervisors and corrections have written letters to the court asking for their resentencing and release. Millions across this country agree. I implore the district attorney's office to end our prolonged suffering and release Lyle and Eric back to our family. 35 years is such a long time. My prayer is that I live long enough to see my nephews again and to hug them once. They're also presenting urgency with some of the ages of the family members that have already been mentioned. And I think they're going to continue to do that. And while it would be awesome if that's what happens and that's what everybody deems to be just, and they are able to welcome a home with open arms before anybody passes again, that, that has a limited effect legally speaking on the process, but there are people involved, right? And when there are people involved, emotions can be involved. And that's something that, you know, they're, they're putting all their leverage points. They're pushing all the buttons they have here. Um, with their attorneys and with the families trying to push for, you know, what they believe to be justice in this case. I have another statement, and this is written uh, by a family member of Marta Cano and Andy Cano, that Andy, the one to whom the letter was written. This is written by one of Marta's children. Thank you for giving our family the opportunity to express our thoughts during this pivotal time in Lyle and Eric's case. Our family's tragedy has always been very public and has been extensively covered by many media platforms. Marta and Andy Cano would have wanted to speak today, but unfortunately they are both unable to do so. Marta is in memory, memory care, but she spent decades supporting Lyle and Eric. Sadly, we lost Andy shortly before his 30th birthday and we miss him every day. Both Marta and Andy deeply loved Lyle and Eric. They both believed in justice, but they also believed in the second chances and forgiveness. It has been 35 years since this happened and we feel enough has, penance has been paid. It is time for them to be released and for all of us to move on and continue healing as a family. Again, if you want to help, please join us at justiceforlyleanderic.org and sign our petition. With that, I'm going to be followed by several members of the Anderson family. First will be Alan Anderson. I never thought this day would come. I am Kitty's sister. I stand here today with a heavy heart and also with hope and justice and understanding. We have received such an outpouring support in recent weeks, which led us to launch this formal initiative. 
for many years, I struggled with terms to terms with what happened to my sister's family. It was a nightmare none of us could have imagined. But as details of Lyle and Eric's abuse came to light, it became clear that their actions, while tragic, were the desperate response of two boys trying to survive the unspeakable cruel of their father. As their aunt, I had no idea of the extent of the abuse they suffered at the hands of my brother-in-law. None of us did. But look at, looking back, I can see the fear and tension that their father had instilled on them. They were just children, children who could have been protected and were instead brutalized in the most horrific ways. By the way, this sounds a lot like a sentencing hearing, right? But a sentencing hearing asking for mercy for the defendants. And we've seen sentencing hearings go both ways, and this is exactly the type of thing you would present. Also, some of the, the rights under Marcy's Law, where victims do have the opportunity to speak to the district attorney's office or to speak at a sentencing hearing or to speak at different processes or parts throughout the process, this is a lot of what it sounds like. Some of it's off the cuff, but a lot of it is prepared. Sometimes lawyers read it. If you have a lawyer, sometimes lawyers may say, okay, put it like this or read this part first or do this part first. Sometimes they don't touch it at all right? Because it's emotional, but also the, the, the writing it out and having them read it helps them stay on track and make sure it's, you know, not taking too much time to lose effect, depending on how many family members want to speak. That's exactly what this is representative of, which I, I think is pretty cool, cool and incredibly effective. And they mix in the lawyers. Another lawyer is going to speak too. I think that represents the actual families because um, Garagos represents the brothers. I think there are other lawyers involved as well. But it's a really good mix here, and I think an effective presentation. And if they went over to the DA's office and did this right after, you could assume it's going to be a very similar presentation and very similar effect. You can imagine now to where this is starting to go on, will they get the resentencing that they're looking for? The truth is, Lyle and Eric were failed by the very people who should have protected them, by their parents, by the system, by society at large. When they stood trial, the whole world was ready to believe that the boys could be raped. Was not ready, excuse me, not ready. This whole world was not ready to believe boys could be raped or that young men could be victims of sexual violence. Today, we know better. We know that abuse has long lasting effects and victims of trauma sometimes act in ways that are very difficult to understand. In the years since their conviction, society's understanding of sexual abuse and its psychological impact has grown significantly. We understand that a person doesn't need to fit a specific mold, whether it's gender or socioeconomic status, in order to experience abuse. In their case, if it were tried today, the evidence of their father's abuse would not only be admitted in court, it would provide essential context for why they acted as they did. So again, I, while I do agree with these and I made some of these arguments myself, it's not necessarily the best appellate argument that if they were argued today, they might be seen differently. Um, but that can affect law change, right? And the effect on laws. And I think it has, a, we've had a lot of law change and things put in like Marcy's law where, and like other battered spouse syndrome information and edits to self-defense and uh, mental health advances. So a lot of that can change the law and the way it's looked at as well. But again, the, the repetition of these rich, strong, good-looking boys couldn't possibly be abused is not the truth. And, and that's, that's a big part of what the trial was like back then, and that's not the truth and not how we see the world today. No jury today would issue a, such a harsh sentence without taking their trauma into account. Lyle and Eric have already paid a heavy price discarded by a system that failed to recognize their pain. They have grown, they have changed, and they have become better men, despite everything that they've been through. It's time to give them the opportunity to live the rest of their lives free from the shadow of their past. While I recognize it is election season, this isn't about us or about the politics. It's about finding the truth, delivering justice, creating space for healing. I want to thank everyone who has reached out by our family to our family in recent days and weeks asking how they can help. Today we have an answer. Please sign our petition at www.justiceforericandlyle.org.
Donorg and urged urge the district attorney's office, no matter who holds the DA position, to consider all the evidence, both old and new, and to bring together justice. Nobody wants anything to be a political issue, and that's smart. It shouldn't be a political issue. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Justice is justice. Injustice is injustice. So everything should be, but they are really pleading for it because they do not want this to become a political issue. Family, and thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry I'm so nervous. I can't help you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Hello, my name is Brian A. Anderson, Jr. I am the kitty of Menendez. I'm the kitty of Menendez's nephew. I am proud to be a member of this family and to help spearhead this formal effort to organize and galvanize all the support we have received. Together, I believe we can finally bring justice for my cousins, Lau and Eric. I've known Lau and Eric my whole life. I can tell you without a doubt that they are not the villains they've been portrayed as. They were boys, young, scared, and abused by their father in ways no child should ever experience. You, the media, focused so much on their actions, but they never were told, they never were able to tell the full story of their abuse that drove them to such desperate measures. When I think about the pain and suffering they endured, it breaks my heart to know that the system failed them so profoundly. They tried to protect themselves the only way they knew how. But instead of being seen as victims, they were vilified. Their father's abuse was dismissed, their trauma ignored, and their truth mocked by millions. Today, we know the trauma, we know that trauma can lead to actions that, while difficult to understand, are rooted in survival. Lyle and Eric acted out of fear, but the jury never heard the full story. If their trial were held today, their father's abuse would be front and center in their defense, and I believe the outcome would be very different. Lyle and Eric are not the same people they were 35 years ago. They've shown that they are more than their past. They are survivors and deserve a chance to rebuild their lives. They are no longer a threat to society. Please do not misconstrue this to be political. Justice should prevail and transcend politics. I am asking the district attorney's office, regardless of who the DA is or becomes, to reconsider their case with the knowledge we now have about their abuse. Lyle and Eric deserve a second chance, a chance to heal, a chance to be free, and to live the rest of their lives without the, without the shadow of their past hanging over them. I firmly believe that if they were to come to my house, knock on my door, I would answer that door. I would welcome them in with huge hugs. My wife would make up a dinner and I'd give them a pillow and a place to sleep. Thank you for being here today, supporting justice for Lyle and Eric. That may just sound like a fleeting statement, but when you think about what they admit to doing to their parents in the house they lived in with their parents, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. That, that truly shows that, you know, this man believes it was truly only because of the abuse, not because they're monsters. And if they were turned into monsters by their dad, they are no longer monsters. So he would feel safe letting them sleep at his house. So that if you think about what happened in this case and what the actions that the sons admitted to doing, not the reasons or the criminal intent or anything, but the actual actions they admit to doing, it's a pretty big statement. Please go to our website, learn the truth about their story, and sign our petition. Thank you. Kitty I'm very nervous. Um, my name is Karen Vandermol Copley. I am Kitty Menendez's niece, and I'm here today speaking out because I have believed for many years that the truth needs to be known about what really happened to my cousins, Lyle and Eric. From the beginning, I believe Lyle and Eric were victims of their father's abuse. I grew up knowing and feeling something wasn't right. The feeling in their house and the father-son interactions were just off. But it was not until the first trial that the full horror of what they had to live through came to light. My sister, Diane, had evidence of her abuse. That was not allowed to be presented at the trial. I cannot help but think of- That comment, I'll just throw in here again, not to throw any cold water on it, but if I had, if I represent victims in criminal cases, which I have all many times, there are so many things that they want to come in at trial that they can't understand why don't come in at trial that certain rules of evidence don't allow to come in. I don't know specifically if that's what she's referencing here, or if it should have come in because 
you know, from all the reports I've heard in the second trial, some bad decisions made by the judge, but some decisions that were legally appropriate and really nothing that any appellate court ever found was an abuse of discretion enough to overturn these verdicts. So there can be evidentiary reasons um, like Lyle not testifying or some experts not being able to testify or some issues happening with experts that that's why certain evidence didn't come in. And again, still okay for victims to complain about it and to feel a certain way about it and to say, this is my stance. This is what I believe. This is what I think the truth is because I have a bigger picture even than what was shown at trial, which can absolutely happen. But it all comes into different ways of when parties and people in the process are taking in information, analyzing it, and making a decision. And right now, it is a lot about the emotional toll, what's happening, what's fair, what's just. And so that can be used here, whether or not it was appropriately um, kept out of the second trial. Of how things would be different if the world had known the truth back then, or if they had been the Menendez sisters. Adults of abuse have difficulty getting out of their situations, and yet these were two young boys who were never allowed to make decisions on their own. They lived in constant fear and were unable to make any other decisions than the sexual violence that they were taught at the very hands of people who were supposed to love and protect them. Their sometimes misunderstood behaviors were cries for help that many of us wished we had realized and responded to far sooner. What happened is tragic, but I forgive my cousins. I have forgiven them forever because I know they were acting out of fear and desperation. These were children children, just six and eight years old, who didn't understand their own bodies. No child should ever have to endure that kind of pain. This abuse trapped them. It was painful and it terrified them. I actually like the way she couches it that I forgive them because what they did was wrong too, right? But there's a reason they did it. And the reason they did it was outside their control because of what people did to them. I like the way she couched that. Their father's abuse shattered their lives and the family's lives and the courts failed them, failed to recognize their trauma, compounding this tragedy. We live in a time now where we understand how abuse can shape a person's actions, male or female. We live in a time now where we understand what trauma does to the brain development of a child. If Lyle and Eric's trial happened today, the outcome would be drastically different. The evidence of their father's abuse would have been a central part of their defense. And it's very likely they would not have received such harsh sentences. Lyle and Eric have spent most of their lives in prison paying for their actions. During that time, they have become supporters and advocates for children who have suffered sexual violence. I believe they have suffered enough. I asked the district attorneys to take into account the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I believe they have paid for their crimes and we as a family have all suffered enough. We are here for them and ready to support Eric and Lyle after release. This is a time for truth and justice and the time for the path to healing. It is time, time for Eric and Lyle to come home. We are here for them. Please visit our website and sign our petition we would love nothing more than for our mom to be able to wrap her arms around Eric and Lyle outside prison walls before she is unable to do so. Thank you. Thank you all. And I represent the extended family members. This is the attorney for the family members now. Of the Menendez family. Um, first of all, the family gathered here in support and really thanks everyone for coming out and for being here and 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 for supporting one message which is you know shouldn't happen again and this needs to stop now and that what needs to happen is the consideration of second chances the consideration of the abuse and changing what we know in our society to be wrong and we know in our society to give people second chances. The family's here united. Eric and Lyle have been through so much in 35 years, but these family members have been through so much 
35 years. They're going to go across the street now. They're going to meet with the DA's office. They're going to exercise their constitutional rights under Marcy's laws to be heard. And they would respect and, and, and ask if they could make that journey peacefully so that they can share their truth, desires, and honesty with the DA's office. Um, and again, you know, thank you for the support and for being here. And Mark Aragos, thank you. As Brian said, if we could let especially um, Joe get across, I'll answer. All right, so they're walking. They're going to take a second. Family's going to walk across to the DA's office. Then Garagos is going to answer some uh, questions. So we'll listen to that together. No, uh, we talked. Part of what Brian had referred to is under Marcy's law, California, the California Constitution uh, requires that victims get a say. So the what we did is the DA's office, when they heard that we were doing a press conference, request or extended the invitation for the family to come over and, and hear about Marcy's law, to hear about exactly what their feelings are. I will tell you, and I said it before, uh, that the DA's office from 18 months ago has taken this very seriously. And I say that because there are times, whether it's high profile, low profile, that I don't get the feeling that we're being heard. Uh, I get the feeling here that we have been being heard. I get the feeling that there is genuine, I think the, the, the DA has mentioned in his remarks that there is a division in the office. I understand that, I mean, I get that, but I don't think that there should be any division when you've got a united front of this many family members, and I know somebody had asked me about one of the um, one of the family members, I would just say I don't want to cast dispersions on anyone. All I will say is think about your own family. Do you think you could get almost unanimous support out of your own family and extended relatives for anything you do? So I'll leave it at that. That's a great point, right? It could be what should we have for Christmas dinner and our family's not going to all agree unanimously. And he said we almost have unanimous uh, unanimity here. He also, you know, mentioned one, there's somebody that screams, what about the people that don't support them in the family? Well, I'll tell you, he doesn't answer that question and that's fine. He doesn't represent, or he doesn't have to, it's, it's somebody screaming. And he did just mention there, it's not unanimous, but it's close to unanimous. But what I will say is the people that don't agree, the family members that don't agree, they have a right to, they can go tell the DA's office. We think they should stay in prison the rest of their life. We think they're monsters. We think they did this on purpose. We think they made up the abuse and the DA's office can take that and they can weigh it and they'll make the decision at the end of the day. Um, so he's not saying that they don't have a right to come out and speak. He doesn't say that at all. He says victims have a right to come out and speak. And he is shocked that with all of his experience that this many family members do support the boys, that there's this much unanimity. And he feels like the DA's office is actually listening. He's right. Sometimes they don't listen at all. Sometimes they don't care. But this time they do. Number one. Number two, he mentioned that 18 months ago, he's been talking about this with the DA's office. So this is not something they just picked up in election season. This isn't something they're just trying to use to win an election, which is very important and, and a good, good, uh, supportive comment by Garagos for you know, whoever's running for DA. Well, I, I think interestingly, and I don't know how you measure something like this, but I have been Obviously, I was practicing when this trial took place. I remember in 1994 representing a woman in Pomona, and we used the battered woman syndrome, and she got a voluntary manslaughter. She got probation. And I remember at the time being struck by the idea, and I've confirmed it now in the transcripts of their second trial, struck by the idea that the DA's office on the second trial took the position, and it may not have been wrong at the time, that the battered woman syndrome, that something that diminishes your intent, did not apply to child abuse. And that was on the record. And that's what the judge ruled. So how do I think, what, or how is this evolved? First of all, the younger generation, I hate to say that, makes me seem old. And that's exactly what, you know, I was talking about in the beginning is that we can't necessarily go and overturn certain things that happened in the past, but the way the law is now, the way battered spouse syndrome, battered woman syndrome, whatever you want to call it, bad, battered person syndrome has changed and evolved. And especially with the advances in mental health and so much more research and knowledge of what we know now, it's argued very differently. It's used very differently. And you know how we use that in the appellate world, again, that's why all of their appellate options were technically exhausted in 2005 
And a lot of changes have been made in society and in the world since 2005. So you can't really go back and affect a 1990 verdict, which is why, or 93, whenever it was, which is why we're talking about all this stuff. We're focusing on abuse of boys and battered spouse syndrome, battered children, whatever it may be. But the ticket, the key that has gotten us to unlock this door and even have the chance is the new evidence, the newly discovered evidence, because that is within the rules to potentially reopen this. None of these arguments really are. So we're listening to all this. We're hearing all this. It can be gripping. It can really affect us emotionally. But the real key and the legal reason that we're even allowed to have this conversation is the newly discovered evidence. They don't leave appellate cases open forever for potential law changes or changes in society. Certain times they reopen things like statute of limitations, extension. There's always exceptions in the law. But that's the really interesting part about here is, yeah, we heard a little bit about the newly discovered evidence in the beginning, but the vast majority is not about that. But they clearly, there has been a movement. I think that what happened is that when the Ryan Murphy series came out, it was such a caricature of them that the pendulum swing that backlash actually created a focus on it. And people then took a look. I know that I've seen some of those uh, videos of the first trial that was televised where the DA's office was taking the position that men could not be raped, they don't have the equipment. And you've seen all kinds of arguments along those lines. That is unfathomable in today's age to people who weren't alive back then. So I think that evolution has been, frankly, uh, seismic. What the American law think about I, I think one of the reasons that we mentioned early on in that the family was said it, they had absolutely no hope after 05. So after 2005, they didn't believe, they thought they were going to spend the rest of their life in prison. And they had resigned themselves to it. And all of the programs, I invite anybody to take a look at what's called the Green Space Program that they have. The Green Space Program that they have created down there that's based on the Norwegian model that is something that they have done in order to in, in order to reacclimate prisoners who are being released. I look at both the external programs that they've done and the introspection and work they've done in themselves. I use the term cautiously optimistic. I mean, there is an irony that DA politics played a role in their conviction. I don't know if he meant there's an irony that it played a role in their conviction, meaning it may play a role in their resentencing too. I'm not, I'm not sure what he meant by that. I didn't hear the question though. It's hard to hear some of the questions. Well, look, I, I've said it before and Joan, who you saw her birthday is November, I want to say the 26th, she turns 93. Nothing she'd like more than to have that hope for Thanksgiving. What do you say? That's what the um, question was. What do you say to the people who say they acted out of grief? I have two responses to that. Number one, that's why the letter that predates the killing from Eric to Andy is so important. Number one, it corroborates that it was happening before. Number two, he corroborates that it was happening before. It doesn't necessarily corroborate that it wasn't with greed. But his second point to me is much more effective and holds a lot of weight as to why the greed motive is not something that's still discussed a bunch today. More important. Number one, it corroborates that it was happening before. Number two, People forget this probably before you were born. They went to the grand jury. The DA's office went to the grand jury on the financial motive theory. The grand jury, which will indict anybody on anything, the grand jury rejected that theory. So that is another one of the urban legends. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with him there. 100%. Couldn't agree more with that second point. Um, also, just kind of funny. He's got, he's got a good vibe to him, I, I will say. Some people like him, some people don't. I think he's got a good vibe to him. Definitely a good lawyer. Well, the, I don't think that the protocol in the DA's office is anything about what we're doing today. The protocol today is that you meet with the resentencing unit, you get informed of Marcy's law, and go from there. What do you say people think they should be released? What do you say people think they shouldn't be released? I don't know. I, I will tell you, I've represented, excuse me for one So I don't know that there, other than one-offs, there's always going to be one-offs. I mean, it's the criminal justice system. It was a polarizing case. Remember, part of what happened was back in the 90s, they become a caricature. They were parodying on Saturday Night Live. I would venture to say that would not happen today. So I no, there's I, you know, we're, we're, it's America. There's people with diverse opinions. I just would reiterate 
there were two juries in trial number one, back in the 90s, two juries, one for Eric, one for Lyle, 24 jurors who deliberated, half of them voted not guilty on murder. Half. Well, you need, so, uh, with, uh, Diaz, Says a lot, right? Well, I've, I've said before that the Menudo Declaration by Roy Rosillo is important, uh, but you combine it with, by the way, that is so that you can separate the mental gymnastics. Part of this is to overturn the conviction. The other part is that I think is unassailable, even to your question, to anybody who, who says, well, they should get out. The law in California is crystal clear. Resentencing, they qualify under the resentencing laws on every single factor. It's almost, I hate to say that anything's a slam dunk in the criminal law, but under the resentencing laws in California, they clearly call it. Just to be clear, so you want the conviction overturned? We filed originally for the conviction to be overturned. That's what a writ of habeas corpus is. The other component of this is a resentencing. So it's two tracks. You can pause the habeas while you consider the resentencing. So it's walking and chewing gum at the same time. So you believe they were not guilty? Right? So just generally speaking, resentencing comes when you can prove that basically it was overly harsh um, and the interest of justice as like the overarching theme, right? That in the interest of justice, their sentence was overly harsh. And how do you do that? Throwing everything against the wall. But I honestly truly believe what made this case get a second look, legally speaking, is the new evidence. Because without the new evidence, it's hard to get that key that gets into the door. And that's why he's saying there's kind of two th two angles that they're going with. And the habeas corpus is never going to happen really without the new evidence. Now, the resentencing theoretically could, but again, that's kind of a gray area we all can pontificate. I guess a big deal could be the series on, on Netflix, all the documentaries coming out, the public pressure. And like I told you, public outrage, public pressure, public interest can absolutely have an effect on society. We are society as the public, right? So shouldn't we have an effect sometimes on it? And that's basically what he's talking about with the resentencing. It's no longer in the interest of justice for this harsh of a sentence. It's got to be changed. They've got to be resentenced. Let them out. And that's who they're going to meet with today. If, there, if the habeas would be granted, you would get a new trial. If they are resentenced, the judge under California law has the ability to recall the sentence and sentence them to a wide range of options. But what else I would say is, I don't know if they want a new trial, right? Do they really want to do all that again? What if they just get convicted again? They're right back in the same spot. But it is possible they get a new trial. They charge them with something lesser like manslaughter. They just take a plea deal so they don't have to actually have the second trial. And they either get out or have a shorter sentence. And it's just like a longer process of getting resentenced. Or they go to trial. They <coughs> either, <coughs> excuse me. They either win or they get not the murder charge, but they get the lesser included of um, manslaughter of some sort. And the judge sentences them to time served, which they've already served. And then they get out, right? So there's all sorts of different legal ways where it could end with them getting out. I think the simplest is resentenced to time served. You can hear they rehabilitated, paid their debt to society, no longer a threat to society. Correct. And in fact, I will also tell you, and we may release it tomorrow, part of the mitigation package that we presented to the DA are letters from correctional officers, high-ranking correctional officers, who attest to the phenomenal rehabilitation. We have a number of correctional officers who have actually said if released, they should be released, and that they would welcome them as neighbors in their neighborhood. Simon Anderson, take, Simon Anderson. That is wild, right? For a correctional officer to be like, I wouldn't mind if he was my neighbor with my family and my kids and my wife. I mean, that's, it, this is the exception, not the rule. This is not the normal case. This is the exceptional case. We have to remember that. This is not how every case is going to be looked at. Now, I promise you, there are hundreds of other defendants and victims and families that feel exactly like the Menendez family, and they're not getting the same results. So we just have to keep that in mind as well. This is not the rule. 
There's all sorts of individual factors that are taken on a case by case basis and the courts and the DA's office look at the totality of the circumstances and they do their best to enact justice. At least that's what we can hope for. So who is the brother of Kitty I want to get over there to meet with the DA. Very quickly, Simon Anderson, who's the brother of Kitty Menendez, has said that they are guilty. I, you know, I won't speak to whether they have a plan. I just think that in order to get through each day, that you've got to just ground yourself. It's a long, it's a long road from life without for almost 17 years to being hopeful. So that's I Simon Anderson, who's the brother question. of Kitty Menendez, has said that they're guilty. What do you say to him? Somebody, some way, I don't know who it was, I could give him credit, said about Ryan Murphy that of yes. course he's going to take credit. Huh? I didn't say it, so I don't know. Yeah. What anyway. about the other side? Uh, how about, wait, wait. how about... So I feel like he did talk about the other side um, and he talked about how, you know, it's not always going to be unanimous. And I think the other side has every right to meet with the DA's office as well. And I think they should, if that's what they think is right. And they, they have a firmly held belief in that, that they should. Um, it should be available to victims with differing opinions. And like he said, they're going to be diverse opinions. It's America. Um, but I can't wait to hear your diverse opinions in the comment section. I can't wait to read it, see what you thought of that press conference, what you think about kind of the two avenues with the newly found evidence, habeas corpus motion for potentially a new trial or just resentencing because it's no longer in the interest of justice, which was the vast majority of what the press conference was focused on. So please let me know your thoughts. We'll be respectful in the thoughts always, but I, I want to know what you really think um, as a part of society and the public who has an effect on these things. Um, let me know. Please make sure you guys hit the like button. Um, but until next time, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.